Well, as you could see, we had an incredible week at camp, and God was just, it seemed like every day just something new that God was revealing to us and working on us in our lives. And one of the things that was established at camp is talking about this moment that you have with Jesus. And when you have this moment with Jesus, a life-changing, transforming moment, it should lead to a mission in your life. And this goes for anyone. This is not just for our students who were at camp this week and got to experience this and hear about, hey, if you have this moment with Jesus, if you give your life to Jesus, that should lead to a mission in your life. And the mission for us is clear. The mission as followers of Jesus and disciples of Christ is to make known the gospel. That's it. That's our mission. And if you are sitting here today and you've placed your faith in Jesus Christ, then that is your mission. It's to make known the gospel of Jesus. It's to share what God has done in your life. That's our mission. That is, in that news, honestly, like, it's too good not to share, right? Like, it's too good not to share. And if you truly love people, that is something we should want to share with them, that we want them to know and be a part of. But let's, uh, let's get into our message this morning um, our message is going to be found in Exodus chapter 20, uh, Exodus chapter 20, uh, which might be a familiar passage for you. It is the Ten Commandments. And uh, so we're going to be looking at Exodus chapter 20, verse 7, so you could turn in your Bibles to that. And as you're turning there, I just want to share uh, a memory from my childhood with you. Um, I remember as a kid, I would have a really bad anger problem. Uh, especially when it came to playing video games. And I remember this one day in particular, I was sitting there, I was playing video games. We had a Super Nintendo in our living room. I know, we were very cool. And, no, it was a big deal. I remember getting that Super Nintendo and thinking, oh yeah, I have made it. Like, I have arrived, right? But I remember I'm sitting in our living room. We had one TV in our house. It's not like today where you got a flat screen in every room, right? But no, we had one TV, and it was a big box TV in our living room. And I didn't get to play video games just whenever I wanted because we shared that room. It was a common space. And I remember our TV was in the center of the room, and I was playing video games. My mom was sitting in her recliner over here, and she was doing a crossword puzzle or something and maybe glancing at the screen occasionally. And my dad was over here in his recliner, and he was dozing in and out of consciousness. Like, he could care less what was happening on the screen. Um, but I'm playing my video games, and I've been playing for quite a while that day. And I remember, this is rare. I remember even thinking that, like, no, they don't ever let me play this long. Usually it's a, you know, it's a little bit of time and it's like, all right, get out of here, go do something, right? Get outside, go play with your friends, we're tired of you. And so, but on this day in particular, I remember like seriously hours going by and they're just letting me play this video game. And at some point in that time of just thinking like, man, I've been playing this game for a long time, something all went wrong. What happened was I was playing the video game and I died all of a sudden. I died unexpectedly. And there's something you should know about old video games. In old games, if you don't save, you lose all of your progress up until that point. And that is what happened. I hadn't saved in probably an hour. And so when I died, and it was very unexpectedly and just like, I lost control, like had a complete meltdown in the living room. I remember I have this controller in my hand and I'm trying to like break it in half. Like that's the anger that was boiling out of this young adolescent. And I was just sitting there and just losing my mind. But that's not even the worst part. I'm losing my mind. I'm going crazy. I'm trying to break my controller in half. But what happened in the midst of that tantrum was I yelled three words. I yelled, God dang it. And I didn't say the cuss word because in my mind, it doesn't matter. It doesn't count if you don't say the cuss word, right? It's not taking the Lord's name in vain if you don't say the cuss word. But I quickly realized that was an error on my thinking. And I remember I could just feel the presence of my mother coming upon me. And... <laughs> And she ran to my video game and there wasn't even a chance for me to like 
recoup any of that progress I had lost because she like, nope, off, like she's unplugging things, throwing wires everywhere, and she's like grabbing me by the ear and yanking me into the kitchen. And I remember we're going into the kitchen, and she pulls me in front of the sink, and she opens one of these cabinet doors, pulls out, pulls out this bottle of vinegar. And I knew what was happening because... When I was young and I had a potty mouth, my mom, she would take vinegar and she would shove like tablespoons in my mouth and like make me like sit there with it in my mouth as like punishment for saying things I shouldn't. And I remember right before she shoved this vinegar in my mouth, she said these words and I'll never forget them. And I didn't understand what she was saying in the moment. It didn't fully hit me, but here's what she said. Do you think God can't tell the difference between dang it and damn it? That's what she said. And then that vinegar went in. (laughs) And for a minute or two of gagging and just trying not to, thinking I was going to die, she went on to explain to me, and, and like I said, I could care less what she was saying at that point. I was just angry about my game, and now I'm like mad about this vinegar in my mouth, and all I can taste is vinegar. I'm not hearing the words, but here I am 20 some odd years later, maybe more, 25 years later, and I'm remembering these words of my mom. And she goes on to explain, she's like, any word used with God's name in that manner, Josh, that's wrong. And that's what she was trying to explain to me. That's what she was trying to to tell me. It took me years to fully understand that and why she did that. But what's crazy is I was, as I was studying this sermon and as I was preparing this week and thinking of what's a good example that I can use to help illustrate my point, I thought of my mom. And I was like, wow, way to go, mom. Like, that was awesome. Like, I needed that. I'm so glad you stood up in that moment. I'm so glad for all the moments you stood up. And I started thinking about her And just standing for God's word in our house, standing up for a a principle that seeks God and makes church a priority in our house. And I just started thinking about all those things this week, and I was thankful. She did not waste what God was doing in our life and in our home. And I'm thankful for a mother like that. And this brings us to our text this morning in Exodus Chapter 20, verse 7, it says, You shall not take the Lord, the name of the Lord your God, in vain. For the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Some of you might be sitting there and going, Really, Josh? This is the text? This is the text that God's been laying on your heart and don't take the Lord's name in vain? Because on the surface, it seems so simple and straightforward, right? But it's much deeper than that. In the words of our great theologian and pastor, Jason Stover, because he spoke this a few years ago, he said, I don't know that there is another commandment that we understand less or violate more. And heartthrob. (laughs) But he did a series on the Ten Commandments. I wasn't even going to acknowledge it. I was just going to keep going, but all right. But he did a series on the Ten Commandments a few years ago, and this was literal, a, literally a quote from that sermon and part of his intro about how, I don't know that there is another commandment that we understand less or violate more because we literally, we simply just look at it as a surface commandment and we leave it at that. It's don't say certain words with God's name and you're good. Move on to the next one. But like I said, it's deeper than that. It's so much more. And my prayer today is that we would have a full understanding of what it means to not take the Lord's name in vain as we leave today. So let's get to it. Number one, God's name is to be exalted. The name of the Lord is holy. God is holy. He is holy. The name of God is a representation of his glory. It's a representation of his majesty. It's a representation of his supreme deity. We are to esteem and honor his name. We are to revere it and we're to glorify him. And listen, to do anything less than any of that is to take his name in vain. To not let his name be exalted is to take it in vain. But this is just the first step. Imagine this, you have a conversation with someone here at the church, my name gets brought up. You start talking about Josh. Immediately, you could probably associate certain things 
to my name, right? You're having a conversation. You hear the word Josh. You hear the name Josh. You're like, oh, Josh is our youth pastor, right? You start attributing things that you know about Josh to him. Josh is our youth pastor. Josh is our worship pastor. Hopefully, when you hear the name Josh, you think Josh loves Jesus. Hopefully, you also, Josh loves people. He loves to serve people. When you hear Josh, you might think, Josh is a little weird. He's a little quirky. When you hear the name Josh, you might think his wife is way hotter than he deserves. And I would agree. But give me some credit, come on. When you hear Josh, you might think, oh, is that the guy that always goes over a budget? Okay, that's enough examples. I get it. But we, we associate, I, we associate, associate, we associate identity and reality to a name. These characteristics, these attributes. And it's the same with God. We should associate those attributes, those characteristics, those realities and identities with God. One powerful moment in scripture where God's name is given is when Moses encounters God in, at the burning bush. In Exodus chapter 3, it says, Moses said to God, if I come to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers has sent me to you, and they ask me, well, what's his name? What shall I say to them? God said to Moses, I am who I am. And God said, say this to the people of Israel, say, I am has sent me to you. And I know that phrase might be confusing. It's like, okay, what does that mean, right? I am what I am. What does that mean? This phrase signifies God's absolute being. And let me explain what that means. That means God has no beginning. It means God has no end. There was no becoming of God. He always was and always will be. This is our God. This is his name. I am who I am. His name is to be exalted. Look at some scriptures with me about God's name being exalted. Psalm 8, 1. O Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Psalm 29, 2. Ascribe to the Lord the glory due his name. Matthew 6, 9. Our Father, hallowed be your name. Acts 4, 12. There is salvation in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given among men by which we must be saved. In Romans 10, 13, everyone who calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. God's name is holy. It deser he deserves our reverence. He deserves our worship. God's name is to be exalted. Point two, God's name is not to be misused. God's name is to be exalted God's name is not to be misused. I remember there was this time when my brother and I were playing. It's funny how many of my sermon illustrations involve me getting in trouble. Um, but I have many, so years to come, you'll keep hearing them. But my brother and I were playing in the hallway of our house. And we're wrestling, really. We're not playing. We're wrestling and fighting, let's be honest. And there was this hope chest in our, our hallway. I have a picture of it. Some of you probably had something like this when you were younger, or maybe some of you remember having this in your home uh, with your parents. And so, but yeah, we had one of these in our hallway. And this was a very cherished item in our family. I think it had been passed down. And so my mom was now in possession of it. And anyways, my brother and I were fighting in the hallway and we fell onto it. And the thing was old and one of those legs broke off when we fell onto it. It broke off and we were like literally like leaning on it going, what have we done? Like just like, you know, just rec recognizing the trouble that we were in. But I, I, man I, I like worked it and I got the leg underneath it and I propped it up on it and it looked like it hadn't broke at all. Like I made it look like it was never even touched. But if you touch it, that thing's falling over, right? And so, but here's what happened. My little fix worked for several weeks so long that I forgot about it. I forgot we broken it. 
Well, one day while I was gone, I don't know where I was, but my, my mom was at home, and she came walking through the hallway, and I don't know if the cat jumped on it or something, but that leg had fallen out, and it is leaning over. So my mom walks in the hallway, and she sees it, and she's like yelling my brother's name because he was the only kid there at the time. So she yells at him. He comes in. And to my knowledge, his exact words when my mom began questioning him was, Josh did it. Like, that's his, to my knowledge, that's what I understand took place. And I remember getting home and my mom just scolding me with the fire of a thousand suns, right? And I'm walking in there and she's yelling at me as I'm walking in the door. And I remember I'm standing there and I could kind of see around her and my brother's in the background just like giggling and laughing and just pointing at me. And I'm like, this guy, like not cool, dude, not cool. But it is what it, I mean, don't get me wrong, I was partially at fault. But we should have shared that fault together. And what happened in that moment when my mom questioned him and said, hey, what happened here? And he's like, oh, Josh did it. What he did was he lied about my name. I was partially at fault, but he lied completely about it and said it was all me. He misused my name. And so often we do this with God. We misuse his name. We make up this lie about God to fit our agenda. Agenda. We claim that God told me to. God laid this on my heart. When really, that was just our flesh. Or really, that was the enemy getting in and trying to make us believe or think or see something. We blaspheme or curse the name of God. We swear by God's name falsely. I swear to God that's true when we know it's not. All of these are gross misuses of God's name. And usually, a lot of the times this happens, it's to get what we want. That we have some kind of agenda, and we're using God to defend our agenda. Sometimes people misuse God's name by claiming that he told them to do something, right? Or they say, God revealed this to me. And I'm not saying God can't reveal things, right? And I'm not saying God doesn't speak to us because I absolutely believe he does. But when it contradicts the word of God, when it contradicts scripture, that is not God speaking to you. That is you speaking to you. And so God would never contradict himself in his word and especially in revealing something to you. But people often use God's name to manipulate a situation, to gain favor, right, among others, or to get something they want. Leviticus 19, verse 12, you shall not swear by my name falsely, and so profane the name of your God, I am the Lord. Have you heard or seen these TV evangelists who um, tell their church that they need these private jets, and so their church needs to give all of this money to their church so that they can have these private jets? Now, Pastor Jason, do we need a private jet? Like, I mean... We could probably use one, but, you know, do we need one? That's a whole other story, right? But listen to some of the examples. This is in the actual interview. They asked him. They're asking these pastors, and there's several of them. Uh, there's a couple that come to mind, but there's several of them. And several of these churches that ask for these and buy these private jets have multiple private jets. One, I know, being valued at $54 million for one jet. It's pretty crazy, right? But listen to some of the reasons, one, in front of the church, when starting to like raise money for this jet, one of the things they say is, God wants this for us. Talking about how this will make my life easier. Like, I won't have to like do multiple stops anymore. Like, that's worth $54 million, right? And so, but they continue down this path. But listen to this one, and this is the one that really gets me. Literal words from an interview. It says, this way I don't get ambushed by people asking me to pray for them. This way I don't get ambushed by people asking me to pray for them. I think this pastor might have missed the point. I must have missed those verses in the Bible, right? Um, God does not intend for, our pers for, for his name to be used for our own personal agenda. God's name is about his agenda. God's name is about his glory. And here's the beautiful thing about God's name. Don't miss this. Even... In all of his glory, God's, God allows us to represent his name. God allows us to take on his name. Slide uh, 2 Corinthians 5.20. Therefore, we are ambassadors for Christ. God making his appeal through us. 
To say that we are Christians is to take on the name of Jesus. It's to be his representative. We are his ambassadors to declare his glory and his good news. Which brings us to point three today. My name should point to God's name. When most people think of taking the Lord's name in vain, the first two points that we've made, God's name be exalted and do not misuse the name of God, those make pretty clear sense, right? They're easy to connect to don't take the Lord's name in vain. But here at point three, my name should point to God's name. One of the ways, in my opinion, the biggest ways that we misunderstand this commandment is how we interpret what it means to take the Lord's name in vain. The word vain, for instance, let's look at it. What does it mean? It means empty, hollow, worthless, without purpose. Last week at camp, I got to witness a vain moment take place in our youth group. And it was an interesting moment. Pastor Jason, his daughter Aubrey, where's Aubrey at? She, there she is. Hey, Aubrey. Um, sorry about this. Um, <laughs> pastor kids understand their risk of being a pastor's kid. They're going to show up in sermon illustrations sometimes, right? And so, but last week we were at youth camp and not too recently, Aubrey had hurt her knee and she had to have surgery to repair her ACL and uh, MCL. And so she has just recently had that surgery, but she's been recovering from that. And at camp, she was on crutches and she had this big brace on her leg. Well, day two, she's texting her dad and she's, he's asking her, how are you feeling? How are you doing? Uh, is your knee okay? Is there any pain? And she tells him like, yeah, it's hurting quite a bit. I, it, I am in some pain. And so Jason, being the good father that he is, he begins to search vigorously for a wheelchair in the area, calling different places, looking online, trying to find her a wheelchair so that she doesn't have to walk around on her knee anymore, so she doesn't have to be in that pain. He finds one, he calls me, he's like, hey, do you mind going and picking up? You know, even if we have to pay money for it, like we'll rent it, you know, whatever we got to do, let's get this wheelchair. Just working so hard for his daughter. So I go to Aubrey and I'm like, hey, I'm going to go get you a wheelchair. And she's like, please don't give me a wheelchair. Like, please don't give me a wheelchair. It would be so embarrassing to be pushed around in a wheelchair. And what happened next is a text thread that happened between me and Jason. And I just want to show that to you this morning. All right. So it, you can put that. Yeah, there you go. So me, this is me talking to Pastor Jason. Aubrey assures me she does not need a wheelchair. Pastor Jason, she is a complicated woman. <laughs> I told her to get it and just wheel around on the longer walks. Me, okay, I'll go ahead and grab one and encourage her to use it for the longer walks across campus. And somewhere in this time, she's also texting her dad going, Dad, I don't need a wheelchair. I don't need a wheelchair. Please don't make me get a wheelchair. And here's the next text. He said, that's up to you, man. She is dead to me now. <laughs> me. Kids would rather be uncomfortable and in pain than being embarrassed. Jason, I only have two kids now. I don't even know who you're referring to. Jason just wanted to help his daughter. But because she didn't want his help, all of his efforts were in vain. They were wasted. Now, she did end up in a wheelchair the next day, and she was like, this is awesome. Like, this is, what a good idea. We should have thought of this sooner, like, you know? And all the kids wanted to be in the wheelchair at that point, doing wheelies and stuff. But Pastor Jason's efforts, because she didn't want his help in that moment, guess what? They were wasted. They were in vain. They were without purpose. They were empty. They were turned hollow. And we start looking, when we start looking at this commandment, this is the message that God is giving us. He's saying, don't waste my name. Don't waste what I've done for you. Don't treat me, don't treat my name as empty or worthless or without purpose. Don't let my name come back empty. He's saying, revere me, love me, trust me. Treasure me. 
satisfy your heart with me. Do you know the scripture tells us that God is a jealous God? Read this with me in Exodus 34. You shall worship no other God for the Lord, whose name is jealous, is a jealous God. And people ask me, students have come to me, adults have come to me, how can that be? Why is, why is it okay? Like how, how is it okay for God to be a jealous God? Isn't jealousy a sin? But what so many people fail to see is that God's jealousy for his name, that, that jealousy for, to be supreme, and that jealousy for our affection, that's for your salvation. That's for your joy. His jealousy for his name is for our joy and our salvation. Salvation. Look at some of these verses to back that up. Psalm 25, 11, For your name's sake, O Lord, pardon my guilt, for it is great. Psalm 79, 9, Deliver us and atone for our sins. Why? For your name's sake. Psalm 106, 8, He saved them. Why did he save them? For his name's sake. Proverbs 18.10, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and is what? Safe. It is for his name's sake that we are saved. One last example as we close today. Back in April of 2012, I got to marry my best friend. And seriously... Aside from trusting Jesus as my Savior, best decision I've ever made, hands down, and I think y'all would probably agree with that. But here's the thing about marriage. When two people get married, the Bible tells us they're supposed to become one flesh, right? They're supposed to become one flesh, and they're supposed to love each other above themselves. And traditionally, the wife will take on the last name of the husband. But imagine... For a second, that the husband and wife get married, the wife takes on the name of the husband, yet she continues to still live the same life as she had before. She's still dating whoever she sees fit. She's keeping secrets. She has her own private things, her own private bank account, her own private phone, and no access allowed to her husband. Does that really seem like a healthy marriage that has become one flesh? No. There is no submission to the union of marriage in this situation, in this scenario. It does not honor her husband. It does not honor God. And it does not honor this union and this, this covenant of vows taken between each other. And listen to this, and here's the point. When you joined in union with God to save your soul, and you asked Jesus to be your Savior, guess what you did? You took the name of Jesus upon you. And when we do this, we are called to lay down our lives. We are called to die to self. But here's the problem. Some of us were still living like that union never took place. And that is taking the Lord's name in vain. To claim an identity with Christ, but continuing to look Look, act, think, you know, continuing to live like the world, that is taking God's name in vain. God's name is powerful. And here's my prayer for us today as we close. When people speak your name, when they say your name, whatever that is, may it point to God's name. So let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this time and we thank you for this day what an incredible message, Lord, just to be reminded of as we just, Lord, try to live a life that honors you, try to seek you above all things, and put our trust and our hope and our future in your hands. God, I pray for anyone in this church who's sitting there who hasn't put their trust and their faith in you, God. I pray that today might be that day for them. I pray that the conviction or the tug on their heart that you might be extending, I pray that they would respond and act on that. God, I pray for those of us who have confessed you as Lord and we have trusted you as Savior and we know that we are saved and our name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. God, I pray that if we're sitting there 
And we're thinking about all the ways that we have fallen short, Lord, as as far as just taking your name upon our lives. God, I pray that you would help us today to seek to be better for you, God. To be obedient to you, God. God, I thank you for this church and all that it means to me personally, but also just the fact that this is a church that does not waver when it comes to your word. We're not about our agenda. And if we are, Lord, I pray that you would reveal that to us so that we can fix that, God, and just be about you. We love you, God. And we ask all these things in the name of Jesus. Amen.